Welcome back to A Brief History. This is a series where I explore the fascinating stories behind some of the most iconic aircraft and airlines in aviation history. And today, we're diving into the story of a jet that helped shape modern air travel as we know it, the Boeing 727. In the 1960s, commercial aviation was booming, but there was a problem. Airports serving smaller cities struggled to accommodate the large jets of the era, like the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8. Airlines needed a plane that could operate from shorter runways while still being efficient, reliable, and capable of serving a wide range of routes. Boeing answered that call with the 727, a sleek, innovative, and versatile jetliner that shaped the entire future of aviation. To understand the origins of the Boeing 727, we need to go back to the late 1950s and early 1960s. Jet travel was revolutionizing the airline industry, with aircraft like the 707 and the DC-8 bringing long-range, high-capacity service to major airports. But not every city had the infrastructure to support these larger jets, and airlines were looking for a solution that could cater to smaller regional markets. Boeing recognized this gap in the market, and so did some of their customers. Eastern and United Airlines played a significant role in shaping the aircraft's design. Eastern needed a jet that could serve its extensive networks of smaller airports along the East Coast, while United wanted a plane that could operate from high-altitude airports like Denver. These diverse needs made it clear. The new aircraft had to be versatile. To meet these requirements, Boeing decided on a revolutionary tri-jet configuration, three engines instead of the traditional two or four. This was a bold move as no major airliner had used such a design before. This configuration was chosen for several reasons. First. It provided the power needed for high-performance short- and medium-haul operations without the complexity and fuel consumption of a four-engine design. Second, by mounting the engines at the rear, the wing could remain aerodynamically clean, free of bulky engine pylons, which enhanced the overall lift and efficiency of the aircraft. At the same time, it addressed airlines' concerns about safety and reliability, which were big selling points for passengers. Complementing the rear-mounted engines was the T-tail design where the horizontal stabilizer was placed at the top of the vertical fin. This configuration not only gave the 727 its sleek, distinctive appearance, but also improved its aerodynamic performance. By positioning the stabilizer away from the turbulent airflow over the wings, the T-tail allowed for better control and stability, especially during low-speed operations like takeoff and landing. Boeing wasn't the only one eyeing this market. Douglas had introduced the twin-engine DC-9, and BAC was developing the 111. Boeing needed to deliver something unique to stay competitive. Their solution, not just an innovative engine configuration or a new tail design, but also cutting edge advanced flaps and slats for short field performance. Short field performance was one of the biggest challenges of developing the 727. At the time, many airports had shorter runways and lacked the infrastructure for larger jetliners. Traditional jets of the time, like the 707, required long, well-paved runways for safe takeoffs and landings. For the 727 to succeed, Boeing developed two key revolutionary designs for it, triple-slotted flaps and leading-edge slats. Triple-slotted flaps are a sophisticated type of trailing-edge flap that extend in three segments to significantly increase the wing's surface area around the camber during takeoff and landing. This configuration creates more lift at lower speeds, which is essential for short-field operations. By deploying these flaps, the 727 could generate the necessary lift even at slower speeds, allowing it to safely take off and land on shorter runways that would otherwise be inaccessible to jets. The 727 was also equipped with leading edge slats, which are movable panels on the front edge of the wing. When deployed, slats smooth and re-energize the airflow over the wing at high angles of attack, preventing stalling. This feature not only enhanced the aircraft's lift during takeoff and landing, but also improved its handling characteristics during slower speeds, making it safer and more reliable in challenging airport conditions. These innovations were critical to the 727's success because they allowed airlines to expand their network into markets that previously could not support jet operations. Smaller cities, remote airports, and even high-altitude locations became accessible, helping airlines attract more passengers and boosting regional connectivity. For the first time, jet travel was no longer limited to metropolitan hubs. It became a reality for smaller communities around the world. The Boeing 727 took to the skies for the first time on February 9, 1963 from Renton Municipal Airport in Washington. Piloted by Boeing's chief test pilot, Lou Wallach, and his crew, this maiden flight marked the beginning of an intense testing program to validate the aircraft's design and prove its capabilities. Over the next several months, Boeing's engineers and pilots put the 727 through a rigorous series of tests to ensure it could meet the demands of airlines and operate safely under a variety of conditions. 
One of the most critical aspects of the 727's testing process was evaluating its key innovations. Boeing conducted numerous takeoff and landing trials on short runways to confirm these features worked as intended. Engineers meticulously measured the aircraft's performance, ensuring it could generate the necessary lift at low speeds and land safely on runways as short as 4,500 feet, which was unprecedented for a jet of its size at the time. The 727's ability to operate from airports at high altitudes and in extreme climates was also put to the test. The aircraft underwent trials at Denver Stapleton Airport and other high elevation locations to measure its performance in thinner air. Additionally, cold weather testing in remote regions of Canada ensured the aircraft could operate reliably in freezing temperatures, while hot weather testing in desert environments confirmed it could withstand high heat and maintain engine performance. By late 1963, the 727 had completed thousands of hours of flight and ground testing, paving the way for its certification by the FAA. The testing program proved the aircraft could meet its design goals, and with FAA certification in hand, the 727 was cleared for commercial service, and Eastern Airlines became the first airline to introduce it to passengers on February 4, 1964. Eastern's new Boeing 727 jet. Look how high the tail is. 34 feet. Look where they put the jets. In the tail assembly. That's one reason it's so quiet. The passengers are always riding ahead of the sound. Where does it fly to? I don't know. It flies north. You can hightail it on Eastern's new 727 jetliner to Washington, Philadelphia, and Boston. And a unique new dining service is worth riding home about. Choose from a selection of superb entrees like lobster Newburgh, filet mignon with Bordelais sauce, prepared as you like it. Eastern 727 jet, quiet as a library. The smartest way to leave town? Come fly with Eastern. It is ironically true that Eastern marketed the 727 as the Whisper Jet, and as loud as it may seem to us today, the 727 was very quiet at the time, especially when wing-mounted engines were the norm. The launch customer, Eastern, was the first airline to integrate it into their fleet. Eastern primarily used the 727 for its dense network of East Coast routes, where the aircraft's ability to operate from shorter runways at airports like LaGuardia or Washington National Airport was a critical advantage. Eastern 727 serve both business travelers and tourists, offering efficient, reliable service on popular routes between cities like New York, Washington, and Miami. The aircraft's quick turnaround times and modern amenities made it an instant hit with the passengers. United Airlines, another early customer, had a different vision for their 727s. With Denver as one of its major hubs, United needed an aircraft capable of handling high-altitude airports where thinner air posed challenges for takeoff performance. The 727's tri-engine design and advanced high-lift systems made it well-suited for these conditions. United deployed the aircraft on routes connecting cities across the Rocky Mountain region and beyond where its performance at high altitude and shorter runways proved valuable. American Airlines recognized the 727's versatility and used it in a variety of roles, for shorter regional routes to transcontinental flights. American strategy highlighted the 727's unique ability to handle both high-capacity routes like New York to Chicago and smaller markets with less demand. The aircraft's range and efficiency made it a flexible addition to their fleet, capable of adapting to the airline's needs as the market evolved. Delta Airlines focused on the 727's ability to expand connectivities to smaller cities across the Southeast and Midwest. With its built-in air stair, the 727 could serve airports without jet bridges, allowing Delta to grow its network in areas where infrastructure was limited. The aircraft played a key role in Delta's strategy of bringing jet service to regional airports, making it an integral part of their domestic operations. TWA leveraged the 727 on high-demand routes between major U.S. hubs, competing directly with airlines like American and United. The aircraft's speed and comfort allowed TWA to maintain a competitive edge in markets where passengers prioritized efficiency. Additionally, TWA's use of the 727 for shorter transcontinental routes showcased the aircraft's ability to bridge the gap between long-haul jets and smaller regional aircraft. Within just a few years of entering service, the 727 had become a staple of the U.S. airline industry. Its ability to operate efficiently across a wide range of routes made it a favorite among airlines, and passengers appreciated its quiet cabin of course, quiet by 1960s standards. By the late 60s, nearly every major U.S. carrier had incorporated the 727 into its fleet, with many placing repeat orders to expand their operations further. The aircraft's adaptability meant it could serve everything from busy East Coast corridors to challenging mountain airports, solidifying its reputation as one of the most versatile jets of the time. 
However, by the late 80s and early 90s, the 727's dominance in the skies began to wane. Advances in aviation technology, stricter environmental regulations, and changing economic conditions made the aircraft less appealing to airlines. The 727's tri-engine configuration became a liability as jet fuel prices rose in the 70s and 80s. With three engines compared to the more efficient twin-engine designs emerging at the time, the 727 burned significantly more fuel per mile. This made it increasingly expensive to operate, particularly on shorter routes where fuel efficiency was critical to profitability. Also in the 70s and 80s, stricter noise regulations, particularly in the United States and Europe, targeted older aircraft with noisier engines. The JT-8D engines were not compliant with Stage 3 noise standards introduced by the FAA in the late 80s, prompting airlines to either retrofit their 727s with hush kits and expensive modification, or retire them in favor of quieter, newer models. Many airlines found it more economical to replace the 727 than retrofit it. As the 727 aged, the cost of maintaining its older systems and airframes rose significantly. Airlines began to favor newer models that required less frequent and less expensive maintenance. Additionally, the introduction of digital avionics and fly-by-wire systems in newer jets made the 727's analog cockpit feel outdated, further accelerating its retirement. The 727 was primarily replaced by more efficient modern aircraft such as the 757, 737NG series, and the Airbus A320 family. The 757 offered a larger capacity, longer range, and better fuel efficiency while retaining the 727's versatility. The 737NG became a dominant choice for short and medium haul routes, offering similar seating capacity with lower operational costs. Meanwhile, the A320 family introduced advanced technology and fuel-efficient engines, making it a popular competitor. These newer aircraft not only addressed rising fuel costs and stricter noise regulations, but also introduced updated avionics and greater reliability, ensuring their widespread adoption as the 727 gradually phased out of service. Even as the 727 was phased out of passenger service, many were converted into cargo aircraft, extending their operational life. Its spacious fuselage and built-in rear air stair made it an ideal candidate for freighter conversions. Cargo operators like FedEx, UPS, and DHL used the 727 extensively throughout the 80s and 90s, particularly on shorter routes and regions where its performance on smaller runways was an advantage. These freighters proved invaluable for express shipping during the rise of the global logistics networks. However, as newer, more fuel-efficient aircraft like the 757 freighter entered the market, the 727's role in cargo fleets diminished, with most retired by the early 2010s. Today, only a handful of Boeing 727s remain in active service, primarily used for specialized cargo operations and occasional charter services. Some smaller logistics companies, particularly in regions with less stringent environmental regulations, still operate 727 freighters for short-haul routes where their rugged design and low acquisition costs are advantageous. Additionally, a few 727s have been retained for charter flights, often configured luxuriously for private clients or VIP transport. While these roles are increasingly rare, the 727's reliability and unique capabilities continue to serve niche markets, preserving the aircraft's legacy, even as it fades from mainstream aviation. In its heyday, the Boeing 727 was a true workhorse of the skies, connecting cities, revolutionizing short-haul travel, and proving the versatility of jet-powered flight. While its time in the air is largely over, its legacy lives on in the modern aircraft that followed. But now, I want to hear from you. Have you ever flown on a 727? What are your memories of this iconic jet? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive, don't forget to like this video, share it with fellow aviation enthusiasts, and subscribe for more episodes of A Brief History. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.